Oh, I'm going to do just a quick video. Um, this could, I could teach a little, but I want to upload this uh, real quick. I just, I'm out today, and this is a, a real pretty area. It's a bunch of acreage, and it's right where my daughter lives. And tomorrow, I think I'm going to upload a video called Matthew 23, which I made out here. And I mentioned on that video, I talk about, uh, by the way, I just posted uh, on Facebook um, to watch the uh, David Strickland. There was a case where, sadly, here in uh, Ranzas County, right next to uh, Nueces County, a few years ago, there were two girls that were shot in a park. And because the girls were uh, a couple, they thought initially it might have been like a hate crime against LGBT community. But then when they investigated it, they said it wasn't that. <laughs> I'm going to try and watch it tonight. But I'm not sure why it, it made it to Dateline NBC, which will be tonight. But I do remember when I read about that case, like I read about different things in the paper, it seems strange to me because in that case, they thought somebody else that had a criminal background was tied. Uh, the, the police were focusing on somebody else. And I remember reading in the paper that the defense attorney for Mr. Strickland, who they convicted, because one of the girls died and the other girl's name I remember was Molly Ogan. I believe she survived, but had very bad injuries and the girls were raped and shot in a park here, in a, right next to Nueces County. But um, the defense, I remember this part, uh, they wanted to subpoena the other person that the police thought committed the murder. And the other person had a record and he was also in another state on probation. And they said, no, we want to subpoena him. And they said, uh, no, uh, you know, if he doesn't want to come willingly, but the guy was already on parole for something else and he fled the state. And I thought, that's strange, you know. Obviously, he wasn't going to come willingly, especially if he was a suspect. So they're going to cover that. The reason I mention this is on the video, the last video I made out here, which will be Matthew 23, which I'll upload tomorrow. I kind of talked a little bit about uh, how Scripture talks about uh, all of the angels do the will of God. And there are even times where you see judgment and angels in Scripture. The most famous story uh, we refer to as the destroying angel or the death angel. And that was a time of judgment on the ten plagues of on Egypt during the time of Moses and it's referred in that way and I mentioned the Mothman prophecies simply because <coughs> I watched the movie a while back and a lot of people described uh, it was a true events the movie was not some uh, they added to the movie but supposedly back in I guess the 60s this particular area, people saw a winged man, but it looked kind of scary. So some Christians, I googled it, some said, you know, obviously it was a demon, and there's a whole bunch of questions on why, what these things are that people identify as UFOs and things of that nature. But as I looked at it, I said, you know, also in Scripture when there are angels that appear to people, Sometimes they appear as other human beings, and people are not frightened. But in the book of Revelation, you have some, they're referred to as beasts with eyes and wings, and uh, the King James talks that way. And you have appearances of angels in Scripture, messengers, that when, the, when they appear, uh, the people are frightened, and they fall down. So I just... As I was thinking of those few things, I thought, oh, I'll mention the one thing. And it's strange because as I was reading about the possibility that 
Maybe that was a sign that took place at that time. And people are indeed seeing things. And there are different interpretations for certain sightings, and people say, well, was it UFO or whatever? But there are indeed signs uh, of people seeing stuff. One of the interpretations uh, for the moth thing was a huge owl. Some people said maybe people were seeing a huge owl. So I made that video here a few days ago, I guess on Sunday. And I come out here and walk a lot. This is the spot where I made that video. And as soon as I walk down here, in the tree, right over there, was a giant owl. Now, I've never seen one before out here. He was big. And I must have scared him or spooked him. And then he flew to this tree right here. I tried to get a picture. I switched the camera to, you know, the picture. Tried to zoom, but I couldn't really... I could have got it, but it wasn't... He was far away when I was standing over there. And then as I tried to get a little closer, he took off. But he was a huge, huge owl. And I just thought it was interesting because some of the verses I was going to add uh, to that strange thing, like why was I thinking of that moth stuff? And then I read through Isaiah, which I kind of read a chapter or two, like I do Proverbs and Psalms. And there was a couple of verses right after I was thinking of that that talks about the moth. Okay? Now, I'm not giving a scriptural... Uh, argument for the quote Mothman prophecy then. But I was thinking of it just a few days before I read it. There's a few scriptures that talk about judgment. It says God will, uh, they'll be consumed by the moth. In, in my thinking I was just associating that there are judgment times. And I felt it just strange that I came across that huge owl just now thinking that some people felt it was a precursor to judgment. I watched a, a documentary the other night, fell asleep, but I do like to watch the things on, <coughs> I don't know how I stumbled across it on Netflix, I think, but it was on various uh, people with the Innocence Project, Barry Shrecknell, and I like to see those cases. They had one black man that a woman had acute, they had an officer, a cop, I think this was Massachusetts. These are men that were convicted of various crimes. And I think that cop did like 20 years in prison. I, I watched a few cases and then fell asleep. But, but they showed through the DNA testing how the men were later exonerated. And I remember the case with the one cop. The judge and prosecutor apologized to him because he did, you know, multiple years in prison. And uh, he gave his statement when they exonerated him. And he said, uh, the administration of justice in the state of Massachusetts is, quote, a crock of shit. And the prosecutor apologized to him. He was, a, I believe that was a cop. But then they had the, a black man who <coughs> was at his friend's house. And his friend told him that some lady down the street said you raped her and he's giving his story the black man and he told his friend he said uh, what do you mean I don't even know who she is so he said no she just called the cops on you and said you raped her so he waited he told his friend they were young and I believe this is Philadelphia and he told his friend no no I'll just wait for the cops to come and I'll just explain to them, you know, I don't even know this lady. So sure enough, the cops showed up. They arrested him. They charged him with not only rape, but kidnapping and all types of things, he said. And he was like, wow, you know, it just shook him. He was a young man at the time. Well, of course, he was convicted. I think he did about seven years in prison. But they wanted to just test the DNA. They wouldn't uh, test the DNA. Well, they finally, the reason this black man was exonerated, and the whole documentary is on these types of cases, DNA and all, very sh Shrek. But 
they found semen. They finally tested the DNA and they found the semen of four different men in that woman. And none of those men were him. And I remember him saying in the documentary, he said, and she claimed to be like a church lady or something like that. Reminds me of that case in Bishop, which I think is questionable, where the woman accused a man of raping her. He's, they sent him off. But that all took place when Mark Skirku was still the DA, and there's been so much exposure of how that man willingly did a lot of corruption here. But after the man was released, the black man, he said, you know, and now he's back in Philadelphia. I think his parents moved to North Carolina, and they told him, let's move. He said, no, but everybody still sees him as a rapist. A lot of those men were, like, beat down, and they were like, uh, you know, <laughs> there's nothing we could have done. The problem is if there are mistakes that the system makes in these cases, but what you have in some of these is the deliberate, um, those on the prosecution or even cops at times, just knowing that certain things are not true and still doing those things. That's where injustice is. Uh, so I'm going to just upload this quickly. But those are just a, a few cases. I could give you more. But I just thought it was strange, because right in that tree, I mean, it was a huge, huge owl. And I was associating some of the scriptures. I'm not saying all owls are precursors to judgment. But I was associating some of those uh, things. You know, I googled earlier today about corruption in Corpus Christi in Oasis County. And uh, in the past, I saw a couple of sites, but a bunch of my videos and posts popped up just Googling it. And I thought, well, that's good. I'm glad. Because a lot of the situations with some of the guys I just was talking about, they feel like they have no voice. And there's a tremendous arrogance in authority when authority has done wrong. We've had a few cases here in Oasis County where the paper and judges and others, when they exposed corruption with the former DA, when he was approached about it, whether by the media or whatever, he wouldn't answer like there was an arrogance. And that's an injustice within society. I could have talked a little bit on Samuel, because I'm reading through Second Samuel, and uh, there's a really great image. Maybe I'll upload this now and maybe tag this video uh, to something else if I teach a little. But King David, I mentioned on one of the videos that's probably still going to go up, King David has a rebellion within his family. This is Second Samuel chapter 14, I think 15, somewhere in there. <coughs> and one of his sons uh, rapes uh, the sister of one of the other sons. This is Absalom and Amnon. And Amnon rapes Tamar. And Absalom waits and then takes vengeance. And then Absalom gathers people to him. All the people that come with any uh, problems to the king, Absalom uh, endears himself to the people, trying to mount a rebellion against his father David, which he does mount. And so King David, when Finally, the rebellion is in full sway. I mentioned this on the Matthew 23 video and 2 Samuel 1 that's coming up. David leaves the city. He leaves Jerusalem. They're going to bring the ark with him, the priest, uh, Zadok. But David says, no, bring the ark back to the city. Uh, this is in God's hands. If God wishes that I don't return and, I don't get, and something else happens... I, it's in God's hands. He says, but if God delights in me, eventually I'll be returned to the city of Jerusalem, the capital, David's capital. And it's interesting because this is one of the great pictures of Jesus. King David is weeping barefoot, and he's in mourning with his men. And it says, going up the Mount of Olives. 
which is the exact area where Jesus and his men, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which was at the foot of the Mount of Olives, a place where there was great suffering for Jesus and his men. And so when you see King David in 2 Samuel, I'll add the chapter when I post this, but you see him in great mourning as the leader of the people of God, chosen of God at that period of time, but he's ascending the Mount of Olives. In society and in the world and in, even in human government, the scripture talks about all of us giving an account to God. And so I'll upload this real quick. I'll try and add some of those little verses with, uh, maybe I'll put this video uh, with the one that goes up tomorrow. But I wouldn't have made it. I just was talking about judgment out here when I did the video with my daughter. Her house is right back there. It's pretty out here. I tried to get out of the wind. It's where I ride the quads with my son-in-law sometimes. But man, I was just talking about reading some stuff about judgment. And some people thought the owl was sort of a sign of judgment. And man, that owl was huge. And you could see, at first I said, I wonder if it's an owl, but it was. You could see his head right here. But he was big. He was big. I just felt it was significant. All right, I'm going to upload this, and then uh, I'll make comments when I write the post on that imagery of David, the Mount of Olives, okay? There's a lot of good imagery of Jesus that we saw that I taught in, when I did First Samuel, and that was just one of them.